If you've ever wondered what the difference is between, say, a video narration and being forced to somebody's slide night, then wonder no more. Uh, this is a lengthy video I put together based on the trip to Micronesia earlier in the year. And the title, Ship Knots, is a play on Ingold's Life of Lines, which has as a sort of foundational position uh, with regards to animism that things aren't already formed but are perpetually forming. So when it comes to something like wrecked ships, and I guess the general genesis for presenting the information this way came from a discussion that we had at uh, breakfast one night on the, well, one morning on the boat, which is, um, I asked one of the doctors present, uh, present, are these ships or are they reefs? And, uh, and more than that, what kind of ships? The thinking is, uh, this is the sort of Japanese support fleet in the South Pacific uh, during World War II. And they were actually non-naval vessels for a lot longer than they were warships, or at least uh, put into uh, naval service. And adding to that complexity in understanding the difference between an object and a line is the fact that they have obviously been reefs for longer than they were warships or ships. Now, to my father's tremendous credit, this kind of blew his mind. Uh, the idea that if they've been reefs for longer than they've been ships, why do we call them ships? Uh, although his friend thought it was ridiculous and is very much stuck in that kind of grumpy retired, adorably so, but grumpy retired um, medical Cartesian ontology. And it's that sort of Cartesian mistake of... Uh, considering empirical and imperial categories to be reality. So I thought maybe this was the best way of uh, presenting the information and even the video. That is the guiding thread or line, obviously, through, well, it's a struggle to call these creative decisions, but through the alleged creative decisions uh, I mean, we might use another C word for the video, because a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of lines uh, or voices went into the chorus of this experience for me. And I thought, well, I can cut it together into several pieces of about eight minutes or so, uh, get the nice ones that make me look like a professional videographer and, and all that kind of stuff. But there is no sense in pretending that this is not a tourist video. So you are at slide night. That is what you are here for. And it's also very long, uh, rather than cutting them together, and I, uh, rather than cutting them into pieces. And I think, you know, if I was to uh, put a creative pretense around it, it would be what we're talking about, lines and, and how things are perpetually forming rather than being fixed objects. So there's that. But there are personal reasons uh, behind this decision as well, which is this is... You know, my, my father and his friends are retired now, and um, some of their friends are dead who would have been happy to uh, come along this trip. Some of them are now too old to do the diving. So it has to do triple duty. Uh, it's, it's not just uh, an opportunity to talk about animus concept, concepts whilst diving on a war grave and, and, and showing you some video of that. It, uh, it's long because I want it to be long. Uh, and more than that, it kind of matches my memory of the process. So there's a personal component as well as the group component. Each evening when we got back to the boat, I would cut the rushes from those five dives we did that day into a single video, cutting out all the unwatchable bits, if you can believe that there is a difference uh, in terms of shaky videography here. Uh, but I'd cut them into a single video and, and export that. So it kind of retains that um, way of thinking for me. So it's not necessarily a video about the wrecks of Chuk Lagoon. Uh, it is a video about videoing the wrecks of Chuk Lagoon. Now, one of the reasons there's no sense in pretending this is anything other than a tourist video is, of course, it's um, 
it's shot on GoPro as a consumer camera. Now, GoPro sells these uh, inflatable handles, uh, which is very good if you're doing surfing or kayaking or so on, because obviously if you drop them overboard, they float and you don't lose your uh, expensive Christmas present. Uh, it is slightly more difficult to handle them when you are inside a rusted out Japanese ship and you need one hand to hold the camera and uh, frankly, another hand, as you can see there, to, uh, to hold the torch. Um, my torch was separate, so when you're kind of crawling around rusted bits of metal, it does get a little bit bouncy. Um, over the course of the, the week or so, I got used to kind of holding them both with one hand. But I also actually just wanted to, to retain that. Um, the thing about GoPro is it is sort of the camera that I wished I had or that I knew one day would come when I was in film school and my documentary tutors were enamored with um, digital handy cams and, and all that kind of stuff. They were very, um, very forward thinking in that sense. They, uh, they liked the crispness of digital, but more importantly, they liked the portability. And these bizarre little cubes can go anywhere. And in fact, the uh, friend of my father's who um, dismissed the notion that um, we could maybe call these Rex reefs um, was also filming on GoPro like the rest of the world. And we had a discussion at the end of um, the first day because he had lights and a fixed attachment and you'll see him using them in, uh, in some of these um, shots. And uh, I didn't want to use lights. One, I didn't have any, uh, but also one of the things that impresses me and why it's that kind of film school dream come true is it does very well with ambient lighting. Uh, and I, again, wanted to look like what it was, uh, which is a tourist experience of these wreck reefs. So it kind of comes back to that, mostly after the fact, but um, at least some during the fact verite creative decision. Uh, and I just look at the difference in color when you're in the, you'll see the ones that look very blue are the deep dives that you do first thing in the morning uh, and obviously over the course of the day because the nitrogen builds up in your blood every subsequent dive up until the fifth one uh, is at a shallower depth. So some of the exteriors that are still underwater when they get very blue are quite deep. This one is a sort of middle of the day dive as you can see because it's green rather than blue. There's a bit more light in it. So again if you're unfamiliar with diving uh, I felt like that's better than trying to pretend this is some sort of you know perfectly lit David Attenborough situation. But I also wanted, uh, this time again, I'm just going to talk about the creative decisions that have changed um, since my last visit, uh, because this is another component of how it kind of lines back into my always becoming a creative journey. My first trip to Micronesia was as a 19-year-old to shoot a, um independent documentary on... Uh, well, particularly Nanmadol, but we also came to to Chuk to do this kind of stuff. And uh, a number of things have changed over the course of my, I guess, magical career and my creative career. And what would happen when you would get there um, first time around is you don't see the wreck and, well, you don't see the reef and you don't see the life. And what you see is the ship. So I think here we're looking at a car in a hold, right? So that's the stuff you see. You see the barrels and the cars and the jeeps and the tanks on the deck. Uh, and, and because it looks like a ship, it is familiar to you. However, with the kind of benefit of the sort of intervening um, 15 years between visits, sort of come around to a different way of, of, you know, thinking with the more than human world, which includes the wrecks, but it also includes the fact that these wreck reefs are reefs because they are organisms and persons and homes to organisms and persons. And that you'll see um, maybe, depending if you're at all interested in, in how people shoot consumer video underwater. What I've noticed looking at the old video versus this trip is that I've, I've tried to kind of get more of the natural denizens in it, which includes the fish and, and so on. And particularly as well, 
the divers because this is an interaction of persons, some of whom, you know, live above uh, sea level and some of whom live below. The other thing, I guess, is that I was kind of attempting to show penetrations in single shot, so that's when it gets dark and shaky and cramped. And, uh, you know, we can pretend it's like a Blair Witch homage or something, but here is the, here's the thinking behind it. And I hope to some extent it's succeeded, that you don't um, lose yourself in the uh, hologram narrative that you would if you were watching a BBC thing, you are watching somebody's video of being on a war grave with fish and retired medical professionals. Uh, but also with the kind of single shot things, the, um, the swim lines connecting different parts of the ship uh, and how you encounter them is, is a tourist experience. Uh, it's a tourist experience because you can't, and this is a good um, decision, but you can't do any of these dives without native guides, like that's the law. So professional wreck diving videos often try to erase the divers uh, and, and try to pretend that they've discovered something that no one has before. This is not actually how you experience the wreck reefs uh, when you encounter them, because you are taken on a very precise route that uh, has been mapped out 30 or 40 years ago by the first exploratory divers, and uh, and you were guided by locals who, by the way, um, <laughs> they could do this on a quarter of a tank, and I, I would keep coming up empty. They're astounding at this. So it's a tourist video, but it's more than just a tourist experience. So there are, as I said, other voices in the choir. It is a family trip. Uh, my father and I went, uh, together when I was doing the uh, documentary when I was 19. But he's been, you know, about a dozen times. He started going in, in the mid-80s when uh, it was actually even more difficult to get to. So there's a family component and a sort of revisiting of, of my um, uh, childhood creative aspirations, which is, was important for both of us. There's also, in his case, the Pacific and New Guinea family connections, which have been very closed to me because uh, it's a challenging country to visit. And of course, both his parents are dead and his sister, who is New Guinean, lives in Perth. And uh, he has no relatives in, in New Guinea or Nauru uh, or any of the other places in the Pacific he's been. But it's always felt like home to him. He did medicine originally with the intention of going back to New Guinea and, and working in regional New Guinea in, in um, you know, helping people with medicine. But as is so often the case with these uh, stories, um, he met a girl and, uh, and, and the rest is in some sense history. In addition to that, when it comes to my father's journey, there's, <laughs> there's an element of space cowboys about this, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, some of his friends are dead. Uh, some of them who like diving can't make it. And it was very much a, I don't want to say swan song because they're very stubborn men and may in fact go back even as they age into their mid and late seventies. Uh, my father uses the example of Jacques Cousteau who was diving into his eighties, but when he eventually died, his spine probably looked like an aero bar and he did it every single day. It wasn't a hobby. So we mentioned this stuff, but, uh, um, we'll see. It got to the point where the rest of the group was going on to Ponape to visit Nan Madol after the week or so on the boat. And uh, he quickly changed his plans to stay for just a few more days. And I think that was him and his friends' uh, opportunity to say goodbye to something that is important to them in, in that kind of line, always becoming journey. And they've reached... Um, you know, an elder stage where they have more memories and, and less vitality. The um, You'll see the lightest color here is uh, from the five o'clock dives, which are the shallowest ones that are typically under 10 meters. And my favorite out of all of them, and we dived on just the most amazing stuff, is always the aeroplanes. Because uh, to some extent, um, boats and oceans go together. So even if you find one on the bottom of the sea, uh, it's a boat, it's an ocean, but it's it's very alien to have a uh, a man-made object that belongs in the sky, filled with fish, 
uh, as you can see there. So it has much more of that pathos. And obviously, as you get closer to the surface, you get more of the of the kind of reef life because most of it kind of lives in that 10 to 20 meter layer. So that's the context, if you will. That's the story of uh, how the video works and what I'm talking about. And it reminded me, one of the sort of memories that came to me when um, when you sort of darting around on these little runabouts to get between your various wrecks uh, was on our first trip we surfaced after I think the fourth dive on, on the second day or something and my father said wouldn't be dead for quids um, diving is his favorite thing in the world and uh, and I said to him would it surprise you to learn that the afterlife looks a lot like this uh, I didn't although this is partially true in parts of it. I didn't actually mean the, the wreck components. We're sort of sitting on this boat as the sun is thinking about going down in the middle of this glass flat tropical lagoon. And uh, I think uh, I've been thinking more about that as I was putting the video together. Like, why do I know? Why do I know that? Why, why, is, <laughs> why is the afterlife tropical? And the kind of um, lazy answer is like oh well maybe that's what it is for you and so on you know that kind of everyone gets their own afterlife uh potentially i mean it's probably part of it but the other part of it because that doesn't seem pleasant to people who prefer the cold it's, it's a terrible thing to say to people like ah, oh, the afterlife is very tropical and i think it's bodily i think it's a memory of um in the tropics you are at the closest temperature to normal human body temperature possible so you become it's as close as you can get to being membranous so that there's less difference between your physical form and the surroundings and and the uh, you know if you think about something like isolation tanks and float tanks they work on a similar premise that you have to kind of remove any difference from that baseline so all the sensory input is removed and, and part of that is to make the um, the water that you are in um, the same temperature as the body so you kind of lose the sense of it and it just occurred to me that that is possibly one of the reasons why I think why my memories if you will of the experience of the afterlife are so tropical because it is uh, the closest we get to sort of being embodied yet disembodied from a sensory perspective but it's also it there's something about it. There's something about the smell of the tropics and the sunset and so on that, again, it may surprise you if you're from colder climes, but it does make you think of ghosts. Uh, it makes you think of um, things that pass, and it's not ghosts in the sort of carve a pumpkin New England sit around the fire sense. It's more the flow or line or always becomingness in between life and uh, or physical life and non-physical life and uh, that mode was something again with uh, with the benefit of being better at magic than i was when i was 19 and and maybe being more um, decolonial in my in my interests and in my discussions with uh, the two keys so in one instance um Myself and, and one of the guides surfaced early and we're just bobbing around in the water at the front of the boat um, waiting for the others and uh, and I asked him just like as a normal question I said um, what's the most haunted wreck in the lagoon and he kind of cocked his head and said the Fujikawa Maru just like it was a normal question like which one has the most tanks left on it it was a um, it wasn't an abnormal question for him uh, this was contrasted quite a bit with actually the same day when we got back to the main boat, um, the Thorfinn. The captain of it, Captain Lance, uh, who was, he has like his registered business is I think registered business number one uh, in Chuuk. He's originally a Canadian um, and he, he did North Pacific game fishing before realizing that is a... Uh, the climate <laughs> in, in, for such a life isn't great. I think he was the first, he was the youngest ever Canadian to have a captain's license. I think he had his at 16 or something. Remarkable man. You wouldn't believe, odd, obviously, but you wouldn't believe someone like that exists. He's, he walks straight out of a novel. 
Anyway, one of the reasons he has business number one in uh, in Shuk is uh, he's one of the foundational people who set up the tourist industry, and it was him who did a lot of the diving to map out what things and identify the ships. And th this was actually useful for the Japanese as well when they came back to collect the war dead and, and, and work out which ship was what and, and so on. But he um, worked out which ones were safe, which ones you could go in, how far you could go in, and, and so on. And this is, you know, decades ago now. This is in the 80s. And one of the other reasons, other than my father's own, although he's healthy, he's old, uh, looming mortality, was that the wrecks are becoming more reef with each passing year, because that's, of course, what happened. Um, we would, my memories of being 19 and, and diving into the holds of some of them that still had the uh, oil cans in them, which you've seen some of already, they were actually on the well, sort of the side of the hull, um, but it was at the roof because the ship was on the side. And they were sort of suspended or floating above you because they still had air in the in the oil tanks and obviously the tanks couldn't get out through it. But there, there are no floating tanks left because clearly the oil tanks have rusted through and They've released their oil and, and fallen to the other side of the hull. But when um, when Captain Lance was doing this stuff, everything was still there. Um, this kind of stuff you're seeing, uh, bones, but also books and shoes and, and things. that it, it was that recent that you um, it looked like a ship on the bottom. You know, stuff still worked. Some of it still does. You can still kind of move things about on the decks, um, which you'll see if you if you keep watching. But uh, he had a very interesting ghost story to tell us about the Hoyo Maru, um, which I sort of made notes on. And, and in, in a, you know, a very entertaining way, he told us the story before we all went and dived on the Hoyo. And it was at, it was at both Coral Sea and Pearl Harbor and declared lost at both. This was a um, support ship, uh, an oil um, refilling support ship for the Japanese Navy. And it was effectively unkillable. So it showed up at Guadalcanal, which I've also dived uh, in the Solomons, and it was declared lost there too. When it was seen departing from Pearl Harbor because it's an oil ship, it was just completely on fire. But uh, it survived. And it survived to after Guadalcanal, uh, which is just south of Chuk, about a, for a ship that size, 10 hour um, sail. Uh, but it came up to Chuk heavily damaged and was dry docked. So, um, well, obviously to be repaired. And it's a weird kind of dry dock because the, the, the Japanese obviously had a lot of facilities which is still there and still used um, by the islanders, but it was kind of propped up a bit on a reef so that it could be repaired and, and sent back, the unkillable ship, which meant as the uh, Americans were flying over uh, bombing it, what would happen is um, the first flight that came through, uh, the torpedoes... You, if you know your World War II military history, and frankly I don't, but uh, the the planes would drop torpedoes that would then obviously run along just underneath the surface of the water and, and um, blow up the and sink the ship. But because the boat was kind of sitting on top of a reef that was just a little bit out of the water, it, the torpedoes couldn't hit it. So um, the uh, the first sort of flight came through and then went back. Now, as it happened, um, well, the plan was, well, the subsequent plan, was to get some bounce bombs. So they reloaded the planes with some bounce bombs, and as they flew back in, they saw the captain, uh, as they did the first time, sort of standing um, on the bridge and kind of like what, shouting at them and cursing them and waving his fists at them and so on. And, and the bounce bombs worked. So these are like a skipping stone, right? So you sort of bounce the bombs into it. And what happened was um, it sort of blew up from the side, and because it was on the reef, it... Um, it tipped over. It tipped over most of the way, and so it's kind of upside down and overhanging um, because it had been dry docked before it was bombed. Now, um, Lance said that the wing commander of the group, who was in his 70s uh, when he came back, and this would have been 10, 15 years ago, he came back with his two adult sons, and he was the one who told Lance the story that on both raids they saw the captain who was there shouting at them as his ship was blowing up and, and tipping to the side. They saw him on the bridge yelling and cursing at them both times. And he wanted to come back uh, and dive it, and he did. 
with his adult sons. Now Lance runs the boat, so he, he sends the, the guides off for, uh, with the group. And so one of these um, these Chukis guides took the, took the group down, and, and you kind of swim. Uh, because it's upside down, it's an interesting penetration dive. So you sort of go underneath it, which is actually the deck, and you head in, and this um, this retired wing commander and his two adult sons and a few others went through. And they, um, they swim up, um, to below the bridge, uh, and but because they'd kicked so much silt, uh, because the guides can see in the dark, they're genuinely magical. Um, the guide decided to actually take them um, down, which is actually up um, through the engine room and out through one of the bomb holes. So the guide sort of gestures and, and off they go, and the adult sons and, and the other diver goes through, and they get to the bomb hole, and the guide swims out. And uh, he sort of counts them like he would sheep or something, you know, coming out of the hole. And the retired wing commander is missing. And, and no one's seen him. And so, obviously panicked, uh, back goes the Chuki's guide looking for him. And um, nowhere to be seen. And obviously because he's um, a professional and, and not a commercial diver, he gets a whole lot further in. He gets a whole lot further in into thinking maybe this guy went to the bridge um, and got turned around. He wasn't on the bridge. Um, he started to look further down um, past the bridge into the um, hallway where there's the sort of officer's quarters, but he was running out of air and also things were getting critical. So he had to come back and they went back to the boat and um, Lance scrambled. He called back all the other dive groups and everyone scrambled to go and look for them. And this original guide, as they went back to um, try and find the missing wing commander. Instead of going into the ship, which everyone else had and it had all been kicked up and so on, he went around the outside of it and he was scraping the muck off the portholes um, looking for the wing commander. And he sees this flash of blue uh, way, way in the boat, like they've never dived there before. And he goes back in and he goes, you know, up slash down through the crew quarters and into the captain's quarters and... Uh, no one's ever been there before. Like Lance says this, there's four feet of silt. Like the, he, this is, no one has penetrated this far. It's certainly not on the tour. None of the locals, um, none of the people working in the tourism industry, no one had. And there in the captain's quarter um, is the wing commander's body. Um, regulator in mouth, tank completely empty. Now, as Captain Lance points out, and it's true, why this is unusual, because he's seen a few drownings in his long nautical career, is um, typically if you run out of air, like uh, divers will rip the rig out and, and remove their mask, and it's almost like an automatic, well, it is an automatic reaction because you're not getting air through the device and you, you kind of panic and, you know, knock everything off your face. And this wasn't the case. Um, the wing commander's mask was on and... and uh, and uh, in was the regulator, and he's just there in the captain's quarters, um, which no one had ever been to, and he had no intention of visiting, um, and was led along, and it was would have been impossible for him to find. No one had found it. And uh, this obviously terrified guide came back up, and, uh, and, in, <laughs> and in Lance's words, he quit wet. He said he was moving to Guam, to fold hotel sheets uh, because the ghost of that commander or oh, the ghost of that Japanese captain led the wing commander to his death. That, I mean, people listening to this will say, well, not a long ago, that's exactly what happened. Um, that was a very late World War II casualty. Uh, and it's one of the things that I noticed this time around, <clears throat> being able to maybe have, that's why it's called a new epistemology, new ways of thinking with and talking with um, spirits and reefs and persons and so on. This is um, an alarming but not paranormal uh, experience in, in you know, a Micronesian cultural setting. And it's alarming and so they don't want to do it. That's very understandable. Uh, but that kind of stuck with me because on the first day, what happens the first day of um, diving, you are terrible, uh, especially me. I hadn't been diving for uh, 18 months to two years. And, uh, and you, you sort of acclimate with one of these five o'clock dives I was telling you about, the ones where it's in that around 10 meter level, although we pushed it a bit. And it's the Fujikawa Maru. It's the ship my guide said is, is the most haunted. It's also the kind of showpiece wreck 
of Chook Lagoon. It ha it is everything you want. It look the the top of it now, and this is very different from when I was first there. But the top of it looks like Davy Jones' ship. It looks like a ship made of coral and squid and so on. But you swim in through the torpedo hole and you go through the machine room and and it it is everything you picture what the perfect wreck dive would be. That evening, as I was going to bed and, um, well, going to sleep, and I do my usual sort of um, evening centering and, and, you know, well, the pre-sleep spiritual exercises, um, I it appears that we sort of encountered, I want to say like a, almost like a Shinto robot garden, uh, guardian, because uh, sort of emerging in, in, in mind sight or, or dream vision out of the ocean was this really scary looking almost clockwork guardian pushing us off that looked a little something like the um the trigger cartoon from the firefly movie serenity with the the fruity oti bar thing that was really odd <clears throat> but it was odd in the sense that i hadn't seen anything like that uh, last time because i wasn't as good at it uh my mother, when they came to visit, just speaking of additional ghost stories, kept saying, which I had encountered as well, but she kept saying all these spirits kept coming up to her. Um, some of them still, and this is a discussion we had before she told me, but uh, some of them were still loyal to the emperor, and that's why they were there. And they hadn't been released with the sort of Shinto ceremonies that had come through. And she said, they keep coming up to me. Uh, and because I'm a stinker, I tell her, like, well, I can tell you a few basic techniques um, to prevent that from happening. But we have different modes. So that would have just been your kind of almost basic um, protection exercises. But she's, you know, a channel and an energy healer. So her experience with them is very different. But it does kind of bring up... <clears throat> If we are talking about, are these, what are these things if we stop making them objects and, and have a, a mode of um, always becoming, one of the things they remain, um, almost one of the fixed points possibly, is that they are war graves, officially. Uh, that's part of its continual becoming. So that was another thing that you kind of, uh, I was more conscious of this time from an ethical perspective. Uh, obviously, no one takes anything, and, and everyone's very, um, very good about it. And it's, the question becomes, is it sufficiently different from visiting famous battlegrounds? And I think it probably isn't sufficiently different. Um, you're not actually exhuming um, bodies. Uh, and it, in a funny way... You can make the counter case that visiting them is a, is is a part of memorialization or or, or remembering the events, remembering, uh, and also bearing witness to the other things that has become. Just as you know, the Somme is well a collection of fields, so there are field animals and grasses and and so on. You get another layer of that as as long as you are kind of conscious of it, moving through. So um. We think of them as part of moving to a line model, I guess. Uh, we think in terms of interactions, well, we previously think in terms of interactions, and we should be thinking in terms of correspondence, right, in terms of the uh, Ingoldian line model. And the, the war grave and spirit component of it was uh, very useful in that. So as I said, I, I focus on the fish um, to demonstrate that it is a reef and it is a wreck, but seen with the right eyes, um, and I don't want to say seen with Micronesian eyes, obviously, but I mean seen with eyes that are in correspondence with a Chuki's understanding of uh, spirit. So in correspondence, I have an epistemology and obviously relief system, but in this case an epistemology that allows for things like spirits. It was remarkable to have all these lines to think with. So the Wargrave line, the spirit line, the fish line, the, the personal journey line, uh, because, you know, humans, as with reefs, aren't these fixed objects. They are also continually becoming. Uh, and I guess the other part of it, and this is how 
the line thing further lines on. When we think with reefs, we're thinking with place. And that was the other part of it that I would um, ruminate on on the back deck of the evening. Reefs, as we would understand them, are, you know, they're largely calcium carbonate exudate. Of, of polyps. So if you think of the reefs in, in a tropical setting, just like a normal reef. Uh, but they're more than that. So even if you take out the the wreck part and you're talking about a classic reef, uh, it is the um, calcium carbonate exudate and the living polyps. But it also becomes a home and it also becomes a barrier that accumulates other um, green material and sand and, and so on. So uh, it becomes a home for other fish and other organisms and they move and um, die off and reefs grow in different directions based on um, water temperature and acidity and, and so on. So it's, it's a place that's a no place, that's a, a person and uh, a composite or chorus, so it's multiple lines and it's the most remarkable, I mean, I would, I would say this, I've been, you know, diving since I was uh, quite young, but it's, there are very useful, more than human concepts to think with um, beneath the sea. Uh, and, and this is a very good one when it comes to wrecks to consider what a human interaction looks like in, in that kind of post-Cartesian or post-imperial mode, because uh, there's a lot of genuine pollution. So it, it's it's all well and good to say that it, you know these wrecks have become homes for um, aquatic life, because they have. Uh, same thing with the artificial reefs you create with tires and so on. Uh, but in the case of you know wrecks and, and, and war wrecks in particular, there is a vast amount of oil that is still waiting to eventually corrode and and um, and, and pollute in in the official polluting sense. The, the first time I was there, when I was nineteen, the old timers would say, I heard this through people who got it from the old timers, that the destruction was so great in, in the water of the lagoon that you could almost walk island to island. And this is, you know, big chunks of metal and oil slick and, and, and so on. And uh, it's important you don't... Well, it was important for me not to gloss past that when thinking about um, wreck reef as, as line and a sense of always becoming... And as I said, you can pull that notion backwards in time. These um, these warships were naval ships from previous civilian lives, which were much longer than their war lives. So that only if, are you dealing with reefs that are warships. You're dealing with warships that are just ships. Uh, and all of these pieces of it coming together and all of these pieces of it being on the bottom of the the ocean, uh, not that deep. Why it's the best dive? Uh, why it's the best dive wreck or wreck dive location in the world is um, Chuk Lagoon was Japan's warm water port for the push south, and it's this flat, sandy bottomed, for the most part, uh, 120 feet kind of thing at at its depth, and between 80 and 120 feet. So these things were bombed and just sort of dropped to the bottom of the sea, which wasn't that far. Uh, and it makes it's a sheltered environment, so that it, it's it's a gift of uh, yeah, uh, it's a gift for people who are interested in uh, wreck diving. But its location at the bottom of the sea recalls, if you watch the dominant of witchcraft presentation, something Charles Fort wrote about when he asked the question, uh, what what did deep sea fish think of where do they think their food comes from the the, the biological material that um, that trickles down from or drips and falls down from a surface they'll never see you know sometimes it's the remains of a whale carcass but in general it's the kind of millions of tons of um, biological material um, you know bacteria and plankton and so on that, that just it's just there in their world coming from above and obviously his thinking behind this um, 
is to use it as an analogy for how we understand the Fortean, how we understand the spirit world. Uh, there's stuff that is just there, and um, you would assume that the deep sea fish has some awareness of directionality, but they will never see the surface of the ocean. Uh, and then he, he takes the question further, which is why it's interesting for us here. And he says, what do they think about a piece of a ship that falls off, a, a bit of metal from a ship that falls off and makes its way to the bottom of the ocean? How do they think about that, even if they have some sort of model of, of where their food comes from? And I think it's, again, a good example, probably the best, of just how uh, how much we are in that William James sense, like cats in the library, when it comes to talking about reality and, and the spirits and, and so on. And these are the kind of... Diving, funnily enough, is good for these thoughts, because, you know, you have this mechanical device jammed into your mouth so that you don't drown. Uh... And so you can't talk, you can't talk to anyone else, and you're looking at things, but um, especially when you're deep and you start to get the altered state of consciousness that comes with nitrogen narcosis, your mind wanders, uh, and you do think this, you think spirit, you also encounter the spirits in the case of a wreck dive, but it's, it's a very good place for shutting the hell up and, uh, and thinking with some challenging ideas. And one of those ideas is artifice. So I used the term artificial reef earlier, right? Uh, can we answer my uh, father's doctor friend in, in the affirmative? Can we say he's correct that a wreck isn't a reef because it's artificial? Well, no. Obviously, from the uh, foundational premise of lines of this kind of animist epistemology for a bunch of reasons. Now, uh, the first is to call it artificial encodes that Cartesian split with um, the human world being separate from nature and their interactions being sort of unidirectional and, and always negative. The second is what isn't artificial. I know that's the that would have been probably your first thought. Um, where are you finding this difference? Because, and that, that is true, uh, in the sense that, as we know, before they were reefs, they were warships, and before they were warships, they were ships, but before they were ships, they were mineral in the earth. Uh, and just as you are, I mean, that kind of, if you recall the Leo DiCaprio film, The Beach, um, when the French girl's talking about how you know, it's it's the seduce a woman on a beach, um, we're all made of stardust idea. And that's true, but more recently we were made of forests and ocean and, and so on. And here you come back to this notion, of course, of the line. You come back to a state of always becoming rather than freezing what you are, what a reef is, what a ship is, uh, fixed into into the timeline. So, uh, you know, because it's slide night, I'm going to read a couple of, I guess, supporting academic statements uh, on that. And the first is, or well, the first couple of them are from uh, Dr. Donna Haraway when it comes to problematizing, which I've been about for the last year or so on the blog and in the premium members area, uh, problematizing the the archaisms that come from uh, conservation, even for people who are, who consider themselves, and the majority of the magical community does, uh, very pro the more than human world, right? So uh, this is from uh, Dr. Haraway's Staying with the Trouble, um, which I've mentioned a few times before in the newsletter as well. I am aligned with feminist environmentalist Eileen Christ when she writes against the managerial, technocratic, 
market and profit besotted, modernizing and human exceptionalist business as usual commitments of so much Anthropocene discourse. This discourse is not simply wrong-headed and wrong-hearted in itself. It also saps our capacity for imagining and caring for other worlds, both those that exist precariously now, including those called wilderness for all the contaminated history that ter- of that term in racist settler colonialism, and those we need to bring into being in alliance with other critters. Critters, incidentally, is uh, what she uses for more than human um, persons presumably excluding spirits, and it's fun. Um, For still possible recuperating pasts, present and presents and futures. So what she's saying there is that even like we we bring this wrong headed Anthropocene idea, which kind of ruins our which encodes wilderness as this kind of imperial um, colonizing fantasy of of a a pristine and separate world. Uh, And so we sort of fall at the first hurdle of thinking with. We fall at the first hurdle of thinking with. And then she goes on to quote Eileen, scarcity's deepening persistence and the suffering uh, it is auguring or it is auguring for all life is an artifact of human exceptionalism at every level. So even if you as I said, even if you consider yourself a friend to the more than human, most of the things we think with, and there's a fun more than human there, a stingray Uh, Most of these concepts we think with are um, not up to the task. And as a result, we're going to uh, talk, well, there'll be another quotation from Dr. Haraway's book. The British social anthropologist Marilyn Strathern, who wrote The Gender of the Gift, based on her ethnographic work in Highland, Papua New Guinea, taught me that it matters what ideas we use to think other ideas with. Strathern is an ethnographer of thinking practices. She embodies for me the arts of femative, feminist speculative fabulation in the scholarly mode. If you're unfamiliar with Donna Haraway, she has this whole thing about SF science fiction speculative fabulation, which you can find out more about on the internet, but it's one of her thinking with, right? It matters what matters we use to think other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not, knots, what thoughts think thoughts, what descriptions describe descriptions, what ties tie ties. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. Strathern wrote about accepting the risk of relentless contingency. She thinks about anthropology as the knowledge practice that studies relations with relations, that puts relations at risk with other relations from unexpected other worlds. And that's um, Dame Marilyn Strathern to you or I. But I um, chose that one because it's, I suspect... Uh, I presume referencing uh, referencing Ingold's uh, work with knots and making, which we will come on to, but it uh, it matters what thoughts we think with. It matters what you know stories we use to tell stories, and the uh, the a priori assumption that you can make an artificial versus quote unquote natural um, distinction between reefs is uh, you can as long as you state at the outset that these are the stories I'm going to story with. These are the thoughts I'm going to think with. The separation of human and its artificial world from nature, which is pristine and fixed, and I'm going to think with it. Now, you can, uh, but if you don't state that from the front, you, f- you fall into the trap. Uh, it's not the line thinking that is and I'm in 100% agreement with Dr. Haraway on this. Um, and we're in good company, frankly, if you look at what's going on in conservation and so on. These ideas are, um, these thoughts that we think with are essential and, and fundamentally, uh, fundamentally different. So one more, Dr. Haraway. I'm really enjoying this casual mode. As I said, it, you're... Um, <laughs> You are here for slide night, so now it's just me reading from books. 
What happens when human exceptionalism and the utilitarian individualism of classical political economics becomes unthinkable in the best sciences across the disciplines and interdisciplines? Seriously unthinkable. Not available to think with. Why is it that the epochal name of the Anthropos imposed itself at just the time when understandings and knowledge practices about and within symbiogenesis and sympoetics are wildly and wonderfully available and generative in all the humanities, including non-colonizing arts, sciences, and politics. What if the doleful doings of the Anthropocene and the unworldlings of the Capitalocene are the last gasps of the sky gods, not guarantors of the finished future game over? It matters what thoughts think thoughts, and we must think. Now, that's a very good example. Uh, oh, it's brilliant writing, obviously. Um, but that's a very good example of um, what I was presenting with the dominant of witchcraft and what the experience of wreck reefs uh, in that kind of natural cultural confabulation, to use Donna Haraway's words rather than mine, um, brings up, uh, makes, you know, makes apparent to you as you experience them. Particularly if you refer to Dr. Ingold's notion of the difference between doing and undergoing, because with undergoing, um, you have the um, kind of incomplete encounter. It's you, you aren't the primary agent acting upon the world in, in the Cartesian sense. So in the sense of doing, what you have is the human mind generates an idea or a plan that it executes upon. Uh, upon. Now, that doesn't work uh, with these kind of more than human encounters for, well, multiple reasons. The first one is... Uh, it fails to account for how the thoughts got into your mind in the first place. So again, it's kind of picking a point in the line and going, this is an object, and, and the object then acts upon the flat surface of the world. That's the first one, but also because uh, in that line sense, it is a journey. It, um, it requires the undergoing or the encounter that happens. That's, by the way, just looking up um, human skull that was um, exploded and fused into the um, machine room wall or hull and couldn't be removed by the Japanese. And that's weirdly a, <laughs> a good timed uh, example of um, the difference between undergoing and, and planning. It wasn't actually, um, I didn't realize that's what we were looking at. That's a thing we encountered. But also when you're wreck diving, it has to do with weather and equipment and being guided, so it's something you undergo rather than do and invade. And that fundamentally changes the um, the truth validation or the kind of uh, knowledge validation from the mode that we're talking about, because uh, it's not that separate cerebral uh, imposing on it, it's the undergoing, it's the uh, experience or lining as... Uh, as a, as as the foundation of the epistemology, hence the uh, hence the subtitle of the name of the video, and all of this is kind of talking in a macro sense about, or exploring in a macro sense what this means as a model, <clears throat> and so from a model perspective, we will uh, we will return to Donna Haraway. A model is a work object. A model is not the same kind of thing as a metaphor or analogy. A model is worked, and it does work. A model is like a miniature cosmos in which the biologically curious Alice in Wonderland can have tea with the Red Queen and ask how this world works, even as she is worked by the complex enough, simple enough world. Models in biological research are stabilized systems that can be shared among colleagues to investigate questions experimentally and theoretically. So that's actually quite good. This is what, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Pieces of Eight, or if you're familiar with the uh, ongoing discussions that the premium members have been having to do with big table animism, uh, Hello Shark, uh, this is how it works. Uh, a model is something that can be shared for experimentation, and it's not the same thing as a metaphor, because you can operate within it and share it and, and have it interrogate data. This is uh, 
this is a very useful definition, particularly when it comes to these like pivoting foundational ideas um, and seeing what emerges. And, and again, uh, there are a few better places I can think of doing so than on Rex. But uh, seeing as we are approaching the end of the video, it seems apropos to, I guess, circle back to where we began. Uh, and I will finish up with a quotation from Ingold himself about lines and knots, given that's where we are and that's what we are thinking with. My more immediate purpose is to suggest that in a world where things are continually coming into being through processes of growth and movement, that is, in a world of life, knotting is the fundamental principle of coherence. It is the way forms are held together and kept in place within what would otherwise be a formless and inchoate flux. This applies as much to forms of knowledge as to material things, whether made like artifacts or grown like organisms. In the recent history of modern thought, however, knots and knotting have been largely sidelined. The reasons for this are to be found in the power of an alternative set of closely linked metaphors. These are the building block, the chain, and the container. Though increasingly challenged in fields ranging from particle physics and molecular biology to cognitive science, these metaphors still retain much of their appeal. They lead us to think of a world which is not so much woven from ever unspooling strands as assembled from pre-cut pieces. In this vein, psychologists continue to speak of the building blocks of thought and of the mind as a container equipped with certain capacities for acquiring epistemic content. Linguists speak of the semantic content of words and of their enchainment in syntax. Biologists often refer to the DNA of the genome in rather similar terms, both as a genetic chain and as a plan for assembling the building blocks of life, while physicists, in their exploration of the chain reactions of subatomic particles, aim to discover nothing less than the most fundamental building blocks of the universe itself. However, a world assembled from perfectly fitting, externally bounded blocks could harbour no life. Nothing could move or grow. Thus, the block chain container and the knot represent mutually exclusive master tropes for understanding the constitution of the world, predicated on philosophies respectively of being and becoming. The challenge for, before us in our exploration of the life of lines is to consider how a reversion to the knot after a period during which blocks, chains, and containers have remained the paramount figures of thought, could impact on our understanding of ourselves, of the things we make and do, and of the world we live in. To help frame our questions, we might best begin by determining what a knot is not. Specifically, the knot is not a building block. Blocks are assembled into structures. Knots are bound or tied into nodes or nodules. Thus, the order of the block is explicate in that each is joined to the other by external contact or, or adjacency. The order of the knot is implicate in that the constitutive strands of each knot, as they extend beyond it, are bound into others. The knot is not a chain. Chains are articulated from rigid elements or links and retain their connections even when tension is released. Yet they have no memory of their formation. Knots, by contrast, are not articulated and do not connect. They have no links. Nevertheless, they retain within their constitution a memory of the process of their formation. The knot is not a container. Containers have insides and outsides. In the topology of the knot, however, it is impossible to say what is inside or outside. Rather, knots have interstices. Their surfaces do not enclose but lie between the lines of the material that make them up. How is, in light of that, a ship a knot then? Well, it is the knotting together or the corresponding of many of the all the lines and more that we have been talking through in this video and this if you haven't heard it before 
This is why I kind of had the Donna Haraway it matters what thoughts we think with idea, because first time through it might appear odd or challenging, you know, how do you replace the perception of fixity or um, an object? Um, you know, we're looking at the Thorfinn in the video right now. What are the thoughts we think with when it comes to ships? And the knot is quite good, particularly when you're talking about wreck reefs, because you have the corresponding and coming together in a knot of um, its chemical material, its military story, its ghosts, its uh, the biological components that go into these, you know, um, composite more than human person slash places that are reefs and all of these things go on or end or continue but it is this kind of uh unfixed becoming which is the knot and that i think uh is a very useful idea to sit with not just i use, I use the rex because this is where these thoughts occurred to me uh, but it's a very useful idea to sit with in a wider philosophical sense and in a, uh, you know, magically operant praxis sense when it comes to things like um, living traditions and disciplines and so on. We have the opportunity to think with other thoughts that themselves can come into alignment or chorus or um, so on with uh, adjacent traditions, particularly if you're coming at it from a Western perspective. This is one of the things that's uh, so interesting from a magically operant perspective, looking at where um, anthropology is a sense decolonizing or even anti-colonizing itself, is you start to see, you start to perceive an opportunity of um, thinking with better thoughts that can align us, align us with global magical currents in a non-appropriative or extractive way. And uh, that really is, you know, for Westerners, the holy grail, right? Uh, that really is the, potentially, uh, an epistemology that allows for this is something that will be useful for determining which lines or persons we keep from the current magical renaissance and uh, and how that continues its becoming. Uh, the magical renaissance being another example of Ingold Knot, obviously. Quite a good one. And uh, I'm going to leave you with that. There is... There is nine minutes of video left. Uh, and if you're super into shaky... Scuba video, do continue to watch, but I'm gonna I'm gonna wind up this commentary because I've said what I've had to say, uh, and I would like to leave you with this not notion, and uh, and and I hope you enjoyed it.